Welcome to the JCC Rockland 18th International Jewish Film Festival. I'm Mickey Leader. I'm the Chair Emeritus. Thank you to our Orange Bank and Trust overall sponsor and to tonight's sponsors, Active International, Bonnie and Alan Elkin, Ellen and Arthur Wagner, Apple Bank for Savings. And let's welcome uh, Rafael Zielinski, Gina Wetkos, and Ed Asner tonight. I'm going to give you a little bit of their bios, and then we'll go right into the questioning. Rafael is the director and producer um, and is best known for directing several award-winning independent films, such as Fun, Ginger Ale Afternoon, Hey Babe, Downtown A Street Tale, Hangman's Curse, uh, National Lampoon's Last Resort, and Screwballs. He was born in Poland. His childhood was spent in Europe, Far East, Canada, and high school at Stowe School in England. He graduated from MIT with a degree in art and design where he concentrated on documentary film and was mentored by Richard Leacock, one of the pioneers of cinema verite. Uh, Gina Wenkos is a writer and producer and known for Coyote Ugly, The Perfect Man, and The Princess Diaries. I'll ask her more questions about her background as we go forward. Ed Asner is a television legend, the winner of seven acting Emmy Awards. In all, he's been nominated 20 times for an Emmy Award with 17 nods for primetime Emmys and three for a daytime award, as well as being one of the most outstanding and most respected actors of his generation, equally adept at comedy as he is in drama. He's also made a name for himself as a trade unionist and political activist, and he served two terms as president of the Screen Actors Guild from 1981 to 85. Okay, my first question is going to be for Gina. Would you tell us where you were born and brought up, what schools, <clears throat> college you went to, and how did you get involved in film from the beginning, and what were you doing as a writer then? Um, I was born in um, Florence, Italy, and um, came to the States with my parents uh, as a young girl, and um, grew up in Miami Beach in New York. And I went to college, various places, got my master's in Maryland in painting, fine arts with Grace Hardigan. And um, <clears throat> started writing plays in New York. And that led me to LA where um, some of my plays traveled. And so I went there and it, it came from there. It, from writing the plays. Okay, and what were some of your earliest um, uh, TV um, uh, writing jobs? Um, I wrote for Columbia Pictures, Sony, whatever projects they had. I largely did pilots. My last pilot was um, for CBS. And um, often I would write for uh, different television stars that had what they then called, I don't know if they still do, um, put deals at the, um, at that time, there weren't all the channels and outlets and Fox was like a brand new thing. Um, and that's what, how I lived with my career until I discovered that I wanted to write screenplays. What gave you the idea for this film in the article that was just published in the Jewish Standard in New Jersey, it says that um, it was in the early 1990s um, when you were um, writing screenplays. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's it was during the time that I was at um, Sunset Gower, which used to be the Columbia Studios, and um, which is right in the center of Hollywood area. Um, and, you know, sitcoms are, as Ed knows, you know, they're, they're exhausting. And um, sometimes I just needed a break and I would walk a couple blocks, um, what was that? I guess that's East. No, no, that would be South. To, um, to what I thought was a park, but it turns out it was a Jewish cemetery. And I walked there and, and I found um, comfort there. And the idea, bloomed once 
once I got comfortable in the ambiance, realizing it's not a park, it's a Jewish cemetery. And it just, it felt, um, it, it, it felt heavier to me then once I realized where I was, what it was, who these people might have been, what their journeys, it, it, I just um, found myself returning. And then was my hangout after a while. And is, is that what gave you the idea? And how did the script come about? Um, it, it is what gave me the idea. I just thought of the horrors that some of these people must have survived. Um, and I thought, well, I mean, I wasn't looking for an idea. I just thought of how grotesque it would be for anybody that was deceased or any visitors of their loved ones to see a young girl uh, with a swastika on her. Um, I was, you know, it was a long time ago. I wrote this script in like 1990. So even then I was appalled to learn, you know, having come from New York, I just figured everybody knows about the Holocaust. I was appalled to learn that many people did not know about it. And not only didn't know about it, but said it never happened. So that, that created the girl for me. How long did it take you to write that script? Well, it was a spec, which means I could write it without any interference from studios or producers, or I'm just about three days probably, because wow. when it's that powerful inside of me, it, and I didn't have any interference. Normally when you're writing for a studio, you have to have a lot of meetings and everybody chips in their thoughts and you got to edit and this and that. But since it was just me, I just, I don't know, just, it was important to me. You gave it to your agent and what did he say about it? Well, um, <laughs> he said, uh, he's, he was, to his ability, which was at the, rather slim he was complimentary about the writing but you know he's all about the money and he said are you you know you're supposed to make money on specs because they they go out and if they're wanted you can ask a lot of money for it and he goes what am I supposed to do with this two roles that are not going to attract stars meaning you know actors like no there's no 14 year old star that's going to open a movie there wasn't a 90 year old star that opens as they call it opens a movie and i said well this is what i wanted to write and he that was that so i'm going to turn now to rafael tell us where you were born and you went to school we have yes. that in your interview in your intro sure. okay yeah, um, but and also how you got into film Go ahead. Yes, I was, I was born in Poland, which has a very complicated history with, with the Jews, of course, and it's a, you know, a very rich history. And, uh, but I came to the United States when I was seven years old. And, uh, and I went to different parts of the country. And then we were, my father was transitioned to the Middle East. And we lived actually in Cairo, of all places, for one year, where he was working on housing for low you know for um, low cost housing and then we were transferred to india and we lived in india for five years so my background was very rich and very international and uh, was very interesting because it made me see many different points of view but then i went to school in england and i studied sculpture and sculpture was very lonely so i went to mit to study technology and i realized technology is very too difficult so then i transitioned to film and i fell in love with film first documentary film and then i then a series of roger corman movies was my sort of gateway to hollywood and then to art house independent film which is what i really love doing because those are the most powerful and interesting and human stories you know those are the films they just love making and this is probably the the one that i'm most proud of so I'm going to ask this of both of, of you. Um, how did um, Rafael get involved with you, Gina? Um, and, and how did this script come to be a film and, and Rafael being involved in it? And lastly, and when and how did Ed become involved? So both of you can chime in and, and let us know. Rafael, why don't you take it? 
and I can uh, right, add right, yes, yes. Well, I, I, I saw one of Gina's plays and I fell in love with it and I made a movie out of it and it got into Sundance. And then she showed me the script and I, I read it and I was just moved to tears. I was so touched by it, by the, the characters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just such a, well, also I was not only touched by the emotion and the great characters, but all these profound truths that Samuel tells this girl. I mean, like a thought is more, you know, is more, more can hurt more than a word, you know? They were very profound ideas which were almost Buddhist ideas. I mean, I see, I, they were very universal, very Zen or very um, enlightening, you know, ideas and thoughts. So that really stimulated me. And I just love this film. And I tried to, I mean, the script, and I tried to get it made for many, many years. And, um, you know, finally we we're very fortunate to meet Ed, you know, just by accident. And uh, it was a miracle. And I'm, we're so grateful that Ed, became Samuel because there's no actor in the world that can play this role better than Ed did. Ed, you know, was just such a joy, such an intelligent, profound soul, you know, and so much energy, man, he has more energy than I am. He's, a, he's like a titan, you know, his mind is brilliant. He, 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 you can talk to him about a million things and, uh, I mean, it's very humbling, you know, working with a titan like Ed, and it was just a wonderful experience. Well, uh, for somebody who uh, watched him in all of his um, uh, TV uh, performances and loved him, I can say um, in a thousand years, I would never have imagined him to be in this role, and he is just magnificent in this role. Um, but isn't he amazing in this? Yeah, it, it, it totally vibrates. Totally. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Gina, do you want to add anything to this? Because I think you told us in conversation that as you were trying to present it, um, you had a bunch of people. Uh, Susan Shapiro told me that you had Martin Landau involved in this before you ever um, got to Ed. Well, I, I hate to say it like this, but almost every actor that we went to um you know of course they were elderly men it was rod steiger was attached then he died uh martin then he died um it, and it i was like wow now what um what are, i mean i knew that we were deal you know most men um get frail but ed doesn't and we, I didn't know, uh, Raphael went to Ed and um, he created the character in a different way than I even envisioned it. So it was sort of like a meant to be deal. Mm -hmm. Ed, what are the reasons you found compelling to do this film? Um, and in the film, you tell Casey, you hate the ignorance in the world today. Would you just, um, uh, launch into this and give us your your reasons. Well, I think he was not atypical of a Holocaust survivor. I've known a number of them. They figure out what they want to do with the rest of their lives, and they proceed like a buzzsaw to achieve what they set their eyes on. I, um, in this particular case, he becomes sidetracked by a young thing. Now, we all know that there are always hidden motives behind our activities. And in the meantime, he teaches. He teaches her about life, about disappointment, about survival, about the Holocaust. And out of that, a unity is formed, a construction between two people you would never imagine to have achieved. But they achieved it. And they are made 
complete by that achievement? Um, the messages um, that you want all these audiences who will be watching your film, um, you want them to hear and understand um, what are they in regard to changing this world of hate we know? I'll leave that to the messenger. I, uh, whatever she says goes. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, I won't try to recap what she says. Okay. Uh, so, Ed, um, it has been told uh, that when you met Casey for the first time, it was an unusual situation, um, and that you made her feel very comfortable as a first time actress. Can you relate um, a little bit about that? And perhaps um, Rafael, you might want to add anything. Give me a hint. Yes, I, 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 okay, I'm sorry, Ed. Yeah. Oh, give me a hint. It, what, a few words. Mm -hmm. right. What? Are you asking him or me? I, I read about it there. In, in something, go yeah. ahead. Whoever is awake, please. I can talk to it. <laughs> okay, I, I mean, I, I brought I brought uh, Margot to Ed's house, and they read scenes together, and they were just wonderful. And then I had them walk together, just in silence, and the image of them just walking was just so emotional and so touching that it just brought you to tears. You know this this. This, this man who had lived so much and this upstart, you know, girl, but the way they just walked together, she was helping him and, and he, you know, he just put his hand on her shoulder and they, they, it was only done in silence, but they just walked, 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 and I just filmed that and they became the characters. That was the movie, you know, there was just so much that was unsaid that was just there, you know, they, 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 there was so much... Um, magic in those in that moment between them and then there was no rehearsals you know this is a tiny little movie with no money so basically you know one week later we were on the set and hey it's time to shoot the first scene and you know very often we just shot the rehearsal i was i, I really wanted to have a very natural feeling and not to over direct anything i was more like i tried to use documentary techniques that i had learned you know where you just observe and let it happen. And I think that's why they popped so much on the screen. You know, they become so strong because we didn't suppress them. Although a couple of Wait, moments- Wait, gonna say something. But I must say a couple of moments as a man, I found it difficult to bring the tears. So that's when Gina was on the set and Margot would say, Gina, help. I need to cry, make me cry. And she was just wonderful because Gina, you know, directs theater. And she brought, took her to these exercises and she would come out of a closet, you know, like five minutes later in tears. And, and, and it was just wonderful. So I'm very fortunate to have, to have Gina there um, assisting me in those very, very difficult moments, you know, where it's very awkward, you know, for a man to get a 14 year old girl to cry, you know. I mean, it's not easy. Take away her you know. phone. Yeah. Take away her cell phone. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, cry in a very deep, right. you know, in a soulful way, not in the, you know. I wanted to ask, Ed, did you ad lib any of your lines? Yes, gone. and beautifully so. Quiet. <laughs> I may have gone to go to it this way, but uh, in the main, when I spoke a line, it was written. And I want to say also that the girl is a slender reed. She um, became strengthened because of the role she was playing. And as she played it, the role took precedence. 
and she was faithful to the law wherever and whenever she could be. And I saw her grow into a powerful human being, young, pretty, and tragic. And the tragedy later became real for her. Um, was it your skills as a parent that enabled you to use such gentle but firm psychology in your conversations with her in the film? Because it was so subtle and so strong. Um, and also, I don't know if this is Gina or all of you together or Ed, um, the concern about her being in school, using birth control, getting her mother's permission to live with him. How did that get into the story? It was so clever and so beautifully interwoven into a story about a punk kid, Holocaust denier throwaway, who um, hates everything about her life and is angry with everyone. Well, I just wanted to say that's what attracted me to the script because she, although she's angry and she's bitter and she's also very vulnerable and very hurting for love. You know, it's the, it's the, right. it, you feel the, the hurt and you feel how she, she's just crying for help. And it's that emotion and that, um, that the heart that's there, that's in the script, you know, and I think that's what Margot was able to bring, you know, and we saw that immediately from the first audition. And it was right. a total, you know, total accident how we found her. I mean, I found her just with her mom sitting in a waiting room and I was just drawn to her eyes, you know, and I started talking to the mom and I, you know, she started, we, we did a photo shoot with her and then she became the character. And then, you know, we asked her to audition and the casting director who sent us hundreds of actresses from all over the United States, he was like, oh no, how can you bring someone who's never, done anything like I don't even want to see her and I said no you have to see her give her a chance give her a chance and she you know she came and she did this scene and she was just amazing I mean she was incredible but then I didn't trust it whether was it just that she was amazing that moment that's when I brought her over to Ed and that was when it was all confirmed um it, it looks like in many of the things that I, I read um that she can play parts intuitively that she feels it and, and that's amazing do you think a large part of that had to do with her comfort level with all of you with ed and um you know it it's just amazing how she grows and she is a, a beautiful young woman her eyes are magnificent mm -hmm. um you know can so you can all answer comment? that yeah please um were she with a different actor, um, it may not have happened. Her comfort with Ed's generosity. So, you know, actors, not everybody is generous to bring someone else's level up. And Ed was secure enough to do that. Many actors wouldn't do that. And she trusted Ed. And because she trusted Ed, she was she allowed herself to access her feelings. I mean, she was 14. She'd never done anything. And um, what was untypical, what was atypical about her was her shit, her, you have to have an intelligence to be able to locate those feelings and express them. And I think she's a very intelligent girl. And Ed gave her the safety, like a rubber room in a way to, to, to be that vulnerable. It's um, watching, I watched it again today for the fourth time. Four and times? You, yes, it's <laughs> beautiful. It's a beautiful film and you learn more every time you watch it because you know, you're busy looking at one part of the screen that maybe you missed or if you looked away, you missed and the animation um, you know, I, I loved it the first time I watched it. And I was very impressed with animation. My original training is as an artist. And um, I just thought that it brought such life uh, to the story in a different level, you know, the creativity and then um, the 
it was when she was lying down and then it was painted and then it was animated and then it was her. I just, I hadn't seen that in all of the other three times. You know, you're, you're experiencing all of this at, in different ways. Um, that's what makes a, a, um, a movie that will last for a very long time. It'll be universal. Um, well, I, was, I, I was very fortunate, you know, uh, my wife was the production designer, one of the two, there were two production designers and she did all the scenes with, in Ed's uh, house. That was her area. And she, she's a very talented, you know, painter, graphic artist. And, uh, you know, she did most of these drawings, but originally they also were inspired by one of our costume assistants who actually had the diary that you see in the film. She, I saw her once on the set, you know, writing in her diary. And I said, wow, look at this. Can I just, do you mind if I look at this? And I flipped through it and there were like all these very emotional drawings of this, the angst of a teenage girl, you know? And I said, it's Casey, you know, would we have permission to use this diary in the movie? And um, she said, yes, we we're very fortunate. So her name was Clara. And then we commissioned her to draw the tiger. Uh, which we used in the, you know, in the movie. And then my wife took that and she embellished that idea and she threw in a lot of drawings throughout the film. She really felt the, the character in the film. And I think it gives it another dimension, you know, which uh, really helps us. It's a little gateway to Casey's soul, her dreams, her anxieties, you know, it really makes us understand her. And so as I, I was also going to ask you, um, can you tell us how you financed the film, how long it took you, and a little bit about how long it took you to shoot it? Right, yes. Well, the, you know, we tried to set it up in Hollywood many, many times, and no one wanted to finance it. So finally, you know, we, we took a loan of a hundred, only 100,000, and that was the idea. We're going to shoot it in 10 days. But then we met Margot, you know, and I, and she's 14, you know, and I, I said, well, we really have to use a real 14 year old actress. We can't use an 18 year old, but that immediately made the budget double because when you work with a child, you have to follow very strict, you know, child labor laws. And there's to be a studio teacher on the set, always protecting her. And she can only work for five hours a day, you know, and she cannot, and, and the Screen Actors Guild gave us a huge, you know, hard time. They didn't want us to use her. They, they felt it is massage parlor scenes, you know, difficult scenes, you can't use a 14 year old. So they, they set a lot of very strict rules, you know, and this is the, during this whole Me, Me Too movement, you know, so it was especially very volatile time. So we had to really, you know, um, be very, very careful and abide by a lot of laws, a lot of rules to be able to use Margot. So the budget became, you know, 200,000 for shooting. The, the loan just grew, you know, and then, you know, post-production was more and, and we just hope that we can uh, recoup this money. But if we don't, you know, it's a gift to the world. There's so many beautiful, powerful messages in this film about forgiveness, unconditional love, you know, two people coming together who are opposites, which applies not only to Jews and Christians, but I think it applies to all races and religions and all parts of the world. It's our gift to the world. And Gina did not get paid for the script. I didn't get paid for the, you know, directing. I, I, I owe 200,000, you know, my wife, uh, sometimes she gets very upset at me, but, uh, you know, we feel it's a very important film and we're very grateful okay. to have put it out to the world. And, and Ed so hardly got paid uh, at all either. He's very, I mean, we've made this under this ultra low budget Screen Actors Guild agreement, you know, where all the actors were getting hundred dollars a day. I mean, which is unheard of, you know, Ed would never do that, but he just loved this script so much that he said, I'm going to do it. It's my gift. Well, you all have given a wonderful film to all of us. And um, I just wanted to ask uh, all of you, I'll throw this out to all of you, but with a little um, entree for Ed. Ed, you're known as a lifelong activist for social justice. And um, in another interview, you mentioned how much um, you are 
um, in disagreement with the hate in this world and ignorance. Can you expound on the ignorance in this world for us? Well, I think the, the best example I can give is the United States. Even though we fought a civil war, it supposedly dealt with white uh, over black. It was done. It was done with states' rights versus governmental rights, and the government won. For those who believe in government, uh, and the United States has been coasting for a long time on uh, America the beautiful, America the free, the balance, the this, the that, and bringing in whenever they needed foreigners to do the grunt work. It didn't matter necessarily the color or the faith as long as they filled in the job. We've reached a point in America now whereby color and other than Christianity is the basis for contention between the two sides. And those two sides uh, have finally said they can't take it anymore. They want satisfaction. And it was best presented and exemplified by the police throughout the country, who many times took the jobs, even though they were racist even though they may have been staunch Christian uh, or chauvinists. We have reached a point now where America needs to declare itself finally, forcibly, as a freedom for all. And if we don't spend the next decade or two, exemplifying, demonstrating that we are free for all and, and uh, punishing those who don't observe it, then we are lost. Putin will reign supreme. It's very profound and thank you. Um, you're a social activist, um, uh, par none. Um, Gina, do yes. you want to tell us why the messages of forgiveness and redemption are so important and universal today and how you wove that into your screenplay? And where, where do you see this film going to teach more people? And Rafael, you could um, join in after Gina. Well, I don't believe in forgiveness without understanding and without accountability. I think any everybody should be forgiven if they cop to whatever the crime was. Um, so that's different than just a blanket, I forgive all who have harmed me. I feel that the people should be accountable for their behavior and that's what America is falling on. I mean, as an example, I watched uh, the college admissions um, documentary on Netflix last night where these filthy rich billionaire people have nothing against rich people, but these rich people are gonna scam the system to get their kids in when so many other kids want to be in and then they get like five days in jail. It made me insane. And so it's things like that, that what's, I, I think because of what's happened in America, it's always been there to a degree. Um, it's just become much more obvious. And, you know, to think that Germany would be our moral compass when America cannot rise that's stunning to me and i'm hoping i'm praying 
that we have a new wave because it is it would it would have been so easy to lose this election if just one or two more people were deceitful at the at at the legislative level and the counting and all that and it's I'm not I'm not a well-read political quant or anything like this. I just know in my gut what is deeply wrong. And, um, you know, I think about the George Floyd and I think how many, many of those have happened where there's not a young girl with taping it. How many? Zillions. And if some little girl didn't tape that, nobody would know. So that's uh, that's where I am today. And where do you want the film to go? You had said you'd like to. Uh, well, see. my goal, which was always my goal, I knew one day, you know, I would want to do this. I just didn't know that America would be where it is. And then, you know, when I wrote this, I I didn't feel America was at this level. Um, I want to. I want somebody to. Uh, grant this, finance this, where the film can be shown to high schools all over. I mean, I just read the other day that 20% of New Yorkers don't believe the Holocaust happened. That just, I was like, okay, I can believe that about Kansas, but New York, are you kidding me? And so I want to go, I have the time, I have the energy, I want to go to a school in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in Montana, where, I mean, when my husband met me, he'd never met a Jew. I, we are now divorced, but his mother had never met a Jew. And when you come from New York to Miami Beach, it's kind of inconceivable. And then you realize that the middle of the country, they don't integrate. And so they, they, they have these theories. In fact, um, um, Raphael did an interview that I think he sent you or is going to send you where he interviewed Margot, the actress, and in her truthful 14-year-old voice, she spoke about, and she admitted how little she really knew about the Holocaust and that it, well, maybe it was mentioned in school and she's a bright kid, but there I've, I've since met in, during this I've met people that just flat out tell me it didn't happen, you know, and I want to slug them because I, I just lose patience. But I thought if I could get to schools and talk and have the kids stand up and say, oh, no, you know, you guys are liars. You guys, I mean, they think that. Well, it's, uh, it's also in their families and in the schools, you know, New York State has a, ma a mandate to teach the Holocaust. But I'd be hard pressed to say if any of the schools in the state of New York have a mandated curriculum that goes K through 12. And I do know that uh, the country, Germany, has a full mandate and they teach mm -hmm. even into college level. So, um, that scene. You know, I wish you very good luck with all of yeah, that. I think it'll happen. My favorite scene in the movie is the breakfast scene where, when Ed, you could see him seething, but it's like, are you going to argue with a bird? Are you going to argue with a mouse? Like, he, he lets her know she's wrong, but what are you going to do with somebody that just does not want to learn? When she says, well, my mom told me. Oh, really? And so anyway, that's my personal goal. Well, you made, all of you made a wonderful, wonderful movie. And Ed, we wish you 120 years and keep working and keep telling us all we need to achieve social justice. You did a magnificent job. And um, I wish I had your energy, your strength. I do too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and thank you everybody did any did Rafael did you want to add anything more no I just I just you know look we I just prayed that the nothing like the holocaust ever happens and if this film in in its own little way can help that then I think we've achieved something 
and you know not only the holocaust but holocaust you know there is not nothing as big as the holocaust that has happened but there are you know variations smaller variations all over the world that have happened and are happening and might happen so i hope our film in one way like the butterfly effect you know spreads a little bit of this um light you know to the world right. in its right. own little way as much as we hope it can do we were Thank speaking you. we were speaking in the very beginning before we um uh, started to tape this about I would love to thank um, publicly Susan Shapiro for calling me and offering this film to our Jewish Film Festival in Rockland and telling us that this is really, you should be showing it. And I would like to um, thank you, Rafael, for agreeing to let us have it in East Coast premiere. And um, it was beshert that we would introduce you to Menemsha Films. And so now the world has a chance to see the film. So thank you, Susan, for really getting this all started. Thank you. All right. Thank yes, you very Susan. much, everyone. Thank you, Ed. Thank, thank you, you, Mickey. Thank Very you cool. so much, thank Mickey. You. Thank you, Ed. It's wonderful to see you always. <laughs> Next year in Los Angeles. Next year. Right. <laughs> thank when, you. When the pandemic is quelled, maybe we can all have dinner together. That'd be great. That'll be yeah. wonderful. Yes. <laughs> all right. Take care. Take, stay thank healthy, you. everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.